think about the ability to partner with a company in that way that has been literally successful every single year since 1840. No other financial institution or sector of the finance world that can do that for you. Through World War I, through World War II, Great Depression. Dude, the Civil War. You put your money there instead of a bank, you're mitigating so many more risks that most people don't even realize that they're doing. IUL, it's the most misrepresented product in financial history. That's why I say a properly designed whole life insurance product is the only financial product in the world that will make sure what you want to happen will happen when you want it to happen, whether you're here to see it or not. If you knew you could get on a plane and it was a 99% chance it was going to crash, would you get on that plane? Heck no. Hell no. Not a chance. Why would you put your money into an IUL then? Because and there's it, no downside risk and upside well, yeah, but, potential. This is the Mr. Burr Show. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Man, today is kind of surreal for me to, to have this man on the show that I am about to interview because most of you know me for infinite banking and what I talk about with life insurance, using it to make your dollars more efficient and multiplying money, all that stuff. I learned about that concept March of 2020 during COVID. When I learned about it, my head exploded. I was like, I've got to learn more about this. I went down a rabbit hole. I was watching every YouTube video I could find, and this man was one <laughs> of the main people I listened to and watched on his uh, YouTube channel, Life 180. And just crazy to think it's come full circle. About three and a half years later, uh, we met a year and a half ago yep. at a symposium for one of the insurance companies. And just a solid dude. We started talking, a um, lot in common. We've done some content together. And it's it's cool to have him on the show because we're going to talk a lot about infinite banking, which I know you guys want to hear about. We're going to talk about some other really cool stuff that you guys will get some, <laughs> get some kicks out of. So stay tuned for that. But it is my pleasure to introduce to you the one, the only, Chris Kirkpatrick. That's Welcome to so, the show. Thanks, man. It's so funny you say the one and the only because uh, <clears throat> my name is actually kind of the bane of my existence. Chris Kirkpatrick is actually Justin Timberlake's number two on NSYNC. Yeah. And so like whenever <laughs> you type in Chris Kirkpatrick online, like I'm always fighting against a boy band member, you know, but. He's the one that had like the red hair, right? Yeah. And, and like Eminem in 2002, I think, launched that song. And in it, he said, Chris Kirkpatrick, going to get your ass kicked. <laughs> and of course, everybody calls me, you know, from college and high school being like, dude, what'd you do to Eminem? You know, like whatever. But Oh, that's so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, you're, you're the real I, Chris Kirkpatrick. I am the real Chris Kirk. I'm the one who's like making a difference in people's lives at this point in time. And not singing. Hopefully. Not singing and yeah, you know, dancing I, around. Nobody wants to hear me sing. No one wants so, to see you dance? No, no. <laughs> No, unless so you good. want something to laugh at, but you know. So good. good. Well, let's tell people a little bit about uh, your journey into infinite banking because it it's, yeah. it started off as one of the top producers for IULs, Index Universal Life. Yeah, right? I got into the business in 2009, uh, you know, just after the Great Recession. Um, you know, I got in thinking I was going to become a financial advisor. Uh, my father-in-law was a financial advisor, fee-based planner for... Uh, all the big companies like AG Edwards, Wachovia, Wells Fargo, like he kind of went through those ranks. And um, in 2009, uh, the recession happened. My wife and I moved back to Vermont where our families are from. And uh, we just decided I wanted to get into the, into the business. And so I went in and he wanted me to be a succession plan. He had been in the business about 30 years at that point in time and was like, why don't you just come in? I'll get you an interview, we can make it happen. And I did, I went in. And his boss, Ray, was like, listen, Chris, I think you're going to kill it. I think you're going to be great at this business. But in case you haven't looked around, the economy isn't really good right now. And if you haven't had a job, because I was playing poker for a living before this, mm. right? And, and so he's like, you haven't had a job in seven years. If I hire you in this economy, they're going to fire me. And I was like, well, that sucks. What do I do? And he's like, go get a job at a life insurance company. They'll hire anybody. And so I was like, all right. And so I literally went down the road to a company that's the largest company in Vermont. Um, and I got a job with them and uh, became an agent, fell in love with Index Universal Life. Um, so much to the point where, and I had so much success early and, and drank the Kool-Aid that six months in, I went to my father-in-law, I was like, hey, by the way, that succession plan, it's not gonna happen. Like I'm going to do my own thing because I believe in this. Now, 
Yeah. Fast forward, you know, four and a half years later in 2014, when I realized like IUL wasn't everything uh, that I thought it was. Um, imagine how hard it was to go to my father-in-law and, and say, hey, by the way, remember that thing that I didn't join you for? I went this direction. Yeah. I was wrong. Yeah. You know, and th so like there's so many levels to it. But yeah, so I, I, I got involved, uh, started doing Index Universal Life. Started off as an agent, became the director of business development for the company, and uh, my job was to recruit agents and teach them how to build their business and teach them how to sell IULs. Teach them how to sell IULs, baby. And uh, it's 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 one of, it's so funny because it was it's one of those things like on a surface level, I understand why they're so sexy and so appealing, and why there's so much clickbaity content around it all that makes it sound so appealing. Right. The challenge is the deeper I got, the more I realized that it was all a, a, a smoke and mirrors game and that the whole purpose of Index Universal Life was to shift the risk from the insurance company to the policyholder. And to me, that was completely opposite of what I was trying to preach and what I was teaching people and what I was telling people with the, that they were buying. And so yeah, that was let's, challenging. Let's stay on that because um, yeah. I talk about that a lot with, mm -hmm. with whole life. If it's structured properly, for for infinite banking is yeah. there's no risk. The yeah. risk is on the insurance company because take for instance one of my policies. I think the first big one I did it was mm -hmm. 125 a year. Mm -hmm. That's how much I put in. So I put in 125 the first year. The death benefit 7.6 million. So I put in 125. Yep. If I died the next day, mm -hmm. the insurance company has to pay out 7.6 million dollars. Totally. But I only put in 125. Yep. They have so much risk. Over time, as I keep putting that money in and they can take it and go invest it to make returns and be able to pay the death benefit, sure. their risk shrinks, Sure, right? Mm -hmm. So talk about why that is different with an IUL, why th the insurance company is taking the risk off them. Well, it's not, it's not just the death benefit side. It's the moving parts inside of the policy. So when you buy a whole life policy, like you said, I, I always equate it to, to uh, trying to simplify the conversation of... With a whole life policy, what you're getting is you become effectively a business partner with a life insurance company, right? Right. So when you get paid a dividend, you're basically, you're putting your money in the life insurance company's general fund. They're managing those returns. And then your dividend is basically uh, a, a, a dividend paid out on the profit share of the return of premium, right? Right. For all the profits that the life insurance company is making across the board. Right. And so your mm -hmm. success as a policyholder is directly tied to the success of the insurance company. Right. They're inseparable. Right. So they're making decisions on your behalf, right. basically. They're trying to make you more profitable. And so as a policyholder, you have this direct correlation of saying, man, I want the insurance company to be profitable. The more profitable they are, the more profitable I am because I'm going to share in that success. Right. And that's a beautiful thing when you think about the ability to partner with a company in that way that has been literally successful every single year since 1840. Right. Right. That's pretty powerful. Right. Um, I don't, I, there's no other, no other financial institution or sector of the finance world that can do that for you. Through World War One, through World War Two, Great Depression, dude, the Civil War, everything, like the Civil War, like I know everybody's freaking out right now about the world and politics and all the things that are going on. I don't know if you want to go there, but like <laughs> at the end of the day, I promise you, it's not going to get worse than the Civil War, right? Right? Okay, like, like I think we can all agree on that, you know, hundred percent. And so, life insurance companies even succeeded during that time. We've gone through three different versions of U.S. currency during right. that time. They've managed a transition for all you Bitcoin people out there and crypto people. I don't mind crypto. I love crypto when it's done right and you know expectations are in alignment. Life insurance companies, when digital assets are a viable thing, whole life insurance companies are going to manage that risk better than me. That's my belief. That's a beautiful 100%. part about having your money in a whole life policy. It's tied to fiat currency now because that's what makes sense. But life insurance companies are going to manage that risk because that's what they do. And so but when you put your money there instead of a bank, you're mitigating so many more risks that most people don't even realize that they're doing. Right. right? And so that's <clears throat> so and I know that wasn't the full question. The full question was, why is it different with IUL? Because all those benefits that I just talked about with whole life go out the window when you right. put your money into an IUL contract. And that's what really pisses me off when I see all these crypto guys now. I'm thinking of a couple of them. 
specifically. I'm not going to name them, and it drives me freaking crazy that they're out there pitching and hawking IUL now just because it's a cash flow opportunity, right? And it's totally out of uh, correlation with their own values and their own beliefs and what they're preaching on the crypto side of things. You put your money into an IUL, you are no longer a business partner with the IUL company. You are a profit center for the life insurance company. That right. is the functional difference. Right. Right. And so all the benefits I talked about, about sharing the success, you know, goes out the window. And that's the thing that drives me nuts. All these IUL agents speak out of both sides of their mouth and they go, oh, life insurance companies, you know, have been the most successful institutions in the world. And that's why you should put your money in an IUL. Well, guess what? That has nothing to do with anything anymore. Like, you, you, I promise you, you can put your money in an IUL and the life insurance company, I promise you, will still be here 100 years from now. Right. Right. Succeeding. And they'll do so off of your tears. That's the like, thing is life insurance companies, they're, um, they're super smart. They, mm-hmm. they literally manage risk. So I think, I think one of the things that people need to understand is when, when we look at whole life insurance and when we look at, all right, what do we want to do with our money? And, and you have options. You can say, I'm going to keep my money in a bank or I'm going to keep my money in a whole life policy. Right. It's in, and that, those, are, those are ultimately the two uh, most common connections. They have the most similarities as far as the way the accounts and the liquidity and the growth and like the safety and what people are looking at. That's why we call it infinite banking, right? It's like a whole life policy is a banking alternative. Right. And so if we look at, all right, I could put my money in a bank while well, you're now tied into the fiat currency system. If you, if you look at a whole life policy, you are participating. That's why they call it a participating mutual company in the profit of that company for with a company that's been successful every single year, has paid a dividend every single year, and has been profitable every single year since 1840, right? right. So I challenge anybody to find another company in the world that can claim that there, there isn't there's one. it doesn't exist right and so when we go back to 1840 you think about it i know a lot of people are worried about what's going on in the world right now right with with politics and losing the world's reserve currency status and you know i think it's completely garbage as we're recording this that the stock market just hit a record high you know and and all these things that's fine whatever but as as I know a lot of people are worried about the the world kind of going to hell in a handbasket, so to speak. But if we go back to the beginning in 1860, right? What what happened then? The Civil War. Right. Life insurance companies were in their infancy, only 20 years old, but because of the way they do things, they were still profitable. So I promise everybody right now that it's not going to get worse than the Civil War. If you think it's going to get worse than the Civil War, you probably should just like move to an island like me, <laughs> you know. But like. It's get a bunker. Uh, exactly. Get a bunker, go to New Zealand, you know, do what the, the multi-billionaires are doing and buy a bunker in New Zealand, right? Like go do that. Like at, at the end of the day, being able to have your money with a whole life insurance company is basically saying, Hey, I trust that you're going to manage my risk from a long-term perspective. <clears throat> and when I say manage risk, I'm not just talking about profit and loss. I'm talking about currency risk. I'm talking about, uh, you know, just uh, like total economic calamity risk. Yep. And and it's important to understand that since whole life insurance companies have been around, there's been three versions of the US dollar. They've managed every transition. So it's one of the things that drives me nuts right now is all the Bitcoin people, right? All the crypto people, all the digital currency people that are like, oh, the US dollar is going to be replaced. Oh, there's an agenda to replace all of the currencies with some sort of world-backed you know, digital currency or whatever it is. I choose to not focus on that because I, a I can't control it. B as smart as I feel like I am, I'm not that smart, right? right? And and you know who is that smart? Whole life insurance companies. This is what they do, right? 100%. And so the thing that really pisses me off though is you get all these all these influencers on YouTube, on Instagram, TikTok that are out there pitching all the cryptocurrency stuff, which okay, cool, no problem. But now they're even pivoting and selling IUL. Mm-hmm. Because they're trying to buy into this conversation about about you know the strength and the stability of these insurance companies. I got news for you. If you're going to do it with whole life, their whole life insurance companies, when digital assets become a real viable, usable product, they will shift away from the fiat stuff they have and they will make the transition for you. I, that's why I'm doing it because I think they're going to be able to manage that transition more effectively than I'm going to. Right. right? 
if I had my money in an IUL, I would get burned while they took my money as a profit center to manage the transition to meet the guarantees that they have for all the people in the whole life policies, right? Yes. And so the problem with with all these influencers that are back in crypto and pitching IULs or stealing and bastardizing the whole story and the conversation and the reputation and the goodwill and faith that these life insurance companies have built up over 180 years and and now they're bait and switching people. That's why I call, you know, IUL it's the most misrepresented product in financial history. 100%. And you say profit center yeah. for the insurance company. So yeah. I'm going to try to dumb that down and sure. I'll explain it. You tell me if I'm wrong. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So you put your premiums yep. into an IUL. They go into the general funds and mm -hmm. then the insurance company knows they can make, let's say 4% every year. They know they can make that. Correct. Steady Eddie, 4%. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing, instead of you getting a 4% credit onto your money, mm -hmm. your cash value, mm -hmm. They're taking what they would have given you and putting it into index options. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So then that index, if it loses money, mm -hmm. they just don't credit you anything. You're not earning right. any money inside your policy, right? Yep. But if it grows, let's say by 20%, they have a cap mm -hmm. of let's say 10. Mm -hmm. So they'll credit you 10%, keep the other 10 as their profitability to pay their guarantees. But here's the thing. Mm -hmm. They can lower those caps. Mm -hmm. Right. So if they have an off year, they can say, you know what? 10% is a little too high. Let's lower it to six. Mm. Right. Yeah. So did I explain that correctly? Yeah, Basically how it works. I think you explained it great. Um, I think it's, here's what I'll say is that <clears throat> um, I've done a lot of content around this and I don't think life insurance companies just lower caps for the sake of lowering caps. They have a, uh, uh, a profitability kind of metric that they're after. Mm -hmm. They're going to meet, and I think that's the thing with IUL is they're going to meet their profit metrics no matter what. Whereas with whole life, they're going to make sure you're made whole no matter what. That's the point. Right. That's the shift in the risk. And so, when you put your money into a into an IUL, you called it right. You're putting the money in. It's going to the general fund. That four percent buys call options. But the thing that most people don't talk about is that the the variables are the that four percent can go up and down. That can adjust your options budget and then the cost of options can go up and down right okay right and so what happens typically in a volatile market the cost of options goes up right and so what happens is as interest rates go up which can increase the budget and I know this is a little complicated i usually do it on a whiteboard um but as the options budget goes up because the interest rate environment is going up that creates more volatility because right. it increases the cost of borrowing for companies. It, and the idea, if you understand anything about fiat economics and the Keynesian economic theory, is that interest rates, uh, you rise and increase interest rates to suck money out of the economy. When you suck money out of the economy, that means you depress the asset values, right? right. Technically speaking, real estate values should go down a little bit. Uh, stock prices, valuations will go down a little bit or at least level off, right? But when you do that, that increases volatility. When you increase volatility, options costs go up. All the while, underneath that, you're you're creating this this spectrum on the on the policy that is is just like setting up for self destruction in these yep. IULs. And all the while, it's on a universal life platform with it, which is annual renewable term for a policy that can't ever be paid up. And the older you get, the more expensive it gets. And if all the things don't work out right, listen, here's what I'll say. It's not that an IUL can't work because in a vacuum it can, right? It's just that 99% of the time it won't work, right? right? <laughs> so, so I ask you is if you have a 99%, if you knew you could get on a plane and it was a 99% chance it was going to crash, would you get on that plane? Heck no. Hell no. Not a chance. Not a chance, right? And so why would you put your money into an IUL then? Right? Because and there's it, no downside risk and upside well, yeah, but, potential. But right? but right. So and I did a thing called the IUL challenge and I've, I've it's been going for almost two years now, right? Yeah. And nobody's had the the balls to step up to the plate and actually debate me. I've debate I've I've challenged Doug Andrew to a debate live. I've challenged David McKnight to a debate live. I've challenged Curtis Ray to a debate live. Those are the three biggest kind of most influential uh, IUL people. And every single one of them likes to clap back at me on social media. But when I say, hey, listen, I'm all about transparency. 
why don't we just connect and and do it live? You know, I'm 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 all about like it, it, if you're so right, this is your opportunity to make me look like an idiot, right? Right, and to to prove your point every single time they all back down. Guys, the thing about an IUO that you really need to understand, and you just said it, mm -hmm. there's all these moving parts. Yep. So in a vacuum, mm -hmm. it could uh -huh. work. Like if let's say you're earning, they illustrate really well because they're showing an average return of yep. the S&P 500 or whatever it is. Right. right? Yep. Average is different than actual sure. for one. But all these different moving parts, it has to go perfect for these to work. Yep. Whole life, there's no moving parts. Right. You have a... Level premium, yep. guaranteed. It'll mm -hmm. never change. Contractually yeah. guaranteed. Totally. Level. It'll never go up. And then you have guaranteed minimum growth. Mm. Most companies are two to three and a quarter. Yep. So if your cost never goes up, but your growth never stops mm -hmm. and goes below 2% on the lowest end, that's without dividends. Yep. And as we've touched on, these companies have paid dividends every single year for over 100 years. That means you're going to grow more than the guarantee. Mm -hmm. If it never goes up in costs, but the growth never stops, guess what happens? It's predictable. You know yeah. exactly what it's going to do. Totally. And that's why it's good for infinite banking because there's no guesswork. 100%. And that's that's really important. Like that that is one of the most understated and not talked about uh, elements of the value of whole life insurance. If you look at if you talk to any business owner, any really high level investor and you ask them what is the the number one key to your success it's predictability mm -hmm. that's what investors want is predictable market environments that's what that's why we create more volatility in the stock market that's why you know people start sitting on their money and be, when when there's all these unknowns when we hit an election year and all these things are going on nobody knows what regulations are going to be passed and how all that creates an unpredictable environment and so Smart money sits on their hands mm -hmm. when all these unpredictable environments kind of get introduced into the economy. And so that's that 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 basically is a predictable environment would be whole life and an unpredictable environment is IUL. And if you know, and so I got news for you. Like in a vacuum, IUL can work. But if after looking at all the facts and all the moving parts of IUL, and when you look at that, if you still believe it, you probably also believe that unicorns exist and can fly <laughs> and all these things, right? So I used to believe that when I was five. <laughs> exactly. Um, I was talking to my daughter who lost a, a tooth uh, yesterday, mm -hmm. or my son. My so my my daughter and my son are are sleeping in the same room right now as we're transitioning, right? And so my daughter, listen to this. This is crazy. So my daughter loses a tooth. She's five. She lost she lost two teeth in the last week. And my son comes to me. I'm driving him to school. And he goes, Daddy, the tooth fairy's not real. I go, whoa, what? Like, what do you mean? What do you mean the tooth fairy's not real, buddy? He goes, yep. So last night, I heard the door creak. And I saw mom come and put a dollar under the pillow for <laughs> Kierlin. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. There That's we go. a heck of a way for your kid to learn. But, you know. Quieter hey, with the door. Know? Come on. <laughs> But guys, here's here's one thing I'll say about an IUL versus whole life when using it for infinite banking. And this is what I tell clients all the time. Yeah. The reason why a whole life should be used in an IUL shouldn't mm -hmm. is with infinite banking, all it essentially is at its foundation is it making a spread on money. Mm -hmm. That's it. So if let's say you put your money into a policy and the insurance company charges 5% to borrow the money, mm -hmm. borrow the funds. So you're controlling that money for 5%, right? Mm -hmm. All you got to do is go make more than 5% with the money, and you've mm -hmm. made a spread, mm -hmm. right? Sure. So therefore, you should always be using your cash value. You sh it should be out working for you, making mm -hmm. that spread. Yeah. So if you do that with an IUL, let's say I've been using an IUL, and now I'm 60 years old. It's on a universal platform, meaning it renews every single year with term insurance. Every single year, I'm closer to dying. Yep. Therefore, my cost of insurance goes up exponentially the totally. older I get. Yep. So if the cost is going up like crazy, my money, my cash value is outworking for me, mm -hmm. and the company has a down year. I don't yep. earn anything because there's no growth. Yeah. How does the cost get paid? I have to inject more money into the policy just to keep it from lapsing. Sure. Because I've gotten none in there because it's out working. I can't use my cash value. Yep. I've got to inject more into it just to keep it from lapsing. Policy with whole life, 
if all the money's out there working, by the time I'm 60, the the growth far outweighs the cost of insurance. Totally. So the year yeah. when the growth hits at the end of the year, I can just use it to pay my premiums mm -hmm. and I'll have some left over. Well, I'll say this though, um, on top, not though, and um, certain companies also allow you with whole life insurance to have the policy completely paid up, meaning no more fees, right. no more expenses, no more anything at either 65 or 75. Right. Right. And so, or there are options to do 10 pays, 20 pays, depending on your age, you can get more flexible and, and it, it's infinitely more flexible than people give it credit for. Cause that's one of the things people lean on with IUL. It, it's more flexible than whole life. Only if you do whole life wrong, you right. know, like whole life. I mean, IUL is more flexible all the way around. It is, but not that much more flexible if you really know what you're doing with whole life. Right. And, and I would say, if you're the kind of person that needs the flexibility that IUL offers, uh, there's an old statement my wife and I use a lot. It's just because you can doesn't mean you should. And ultimately, that flexibility that IUL provides is what typically winds up to be the downfall it of puts, most people. It puts stress on the policy. Right. And so there's that. But you know, the 65 and 75 age, you can have the policy completely paid up. Um, I, think, I think that's one of the mistakes that I see um, people make, and it's not a mistake. It's, it's, it's just when, when you do, uh, when you have the option to have a policy paid up at 65 or 75 or at a younger age, you know, based in alignment with how the person wants to use it. If you do a policy that pays up at a hundred, well, you still have, you know, some moving parts that, you know, could be tricky with whole life, depending on how people want to utilize it in retirement. Um, you know, and that that's okay. It's, it's still going to be more predictable and more guaranteed than IUL because the costs are level, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing in IUL that runs away from you, right? Like if you do an index loan with an IUL and there's a negative year, and then you have now all of a sudden you have a million dollars in loans out because you've been taking loans for all this year. And then let's assume it was the market was positive every year straight for 30 years. And then Which never happens, never happens. But like even in a vacuum in a bubble, let's assume it did, right? And then 30 years in, when you're 75 years old, you've got a million dollars in policy loans because you've been taking income from it for 10 years. And then all of the sudden, when you're 75 or 74 years old, let's say, you have a negative year in the stock market, and now you've got uh, a 5% loan rate. Well, now you've got $50,000 of extra costs, plus you have the cost have, uh, for the insurance, which now you're 75, so that cost is even more expensive, have to be paid from the cash value in the policy. On even a flat year, you can. I, I've I've done videos that break down illustrations that show they always say you can't lose due to market loss, but you can lose because of market loss because yes. of these other moving pieces and fees and expenses and charges inside of the policy. You can you can lose ten to twenty percent on a zero percent year in the market. Right when you're in retirement, that's mind numbing. Right, that's it, when you shouldn't have risk. Right, and that's when your risk is going up. And then that that those expenses compound against you, and it gets worse and worse and worse from there. And it's it's um you know at the end of the day, it, people just read every line of the illustration for an IUL before you buy it, and I promise you, you just won't buy it. The main thing I have people read all the time, yeah, the guaranteed side. Yeah, 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 yeah. Guys, on an IUL, <laughs> the guaranteed side goes to zero. Mm -hmm. So they illustrate the non-guaranteed yep. side with fictional or fact no fictional fictional uh, fictional sure. <laughs> fictional fictional we're just mixing words over here fictional numbers of yep. it illustrating at like six percent seven percent every single year which yep. we know does not happen. It's not gonna happen. They assume every year is a positive year, which doesn't happen. The market goes in cycles, Unicorn right? Land. So if the market drops, here's a great example: if you lose fifty percent. You have to earn a hundred percent just to get back to zero. Yeah. So it's not. It's not. It's fabricated. It's. It's the unicorn that it's always going to go up. Sure. And it's not. Right. Right. Yeah. Totally. It's just not possible. Yeah. With a whole life, it only goes up. Contractually guaranteed, at least two percent, mm -hmm. three and a quarter with some companies plus dividends, and these companies they've been around since the eighteen hundreds. Mm -hmm. Think about this. Most companies in general, not even looking at life insurance, yep. have not been around since the 1800s, right? Mm -hmm. So life insurance companies are the oldest companies in the nation, yep. but not only are they the oldest, they're the most profitable, mm -hmm. right? They've been paying dividends, which means they are profitable mm -hmm. 
through every single year, yeah. every single economy, every single bird flu, swine flu, sure. COVID, um, yeah. you name it, mm-hmm. they're profitable. 100%. Well, you know what's interesting about that? So everybody likes to poo-poo the returns of whole life insurance, right? Right. Um, uh, and you'll hear this from a lot of investors, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people being like, oh, whole life is a horrible investment. First of all, you're right. It's not, not an investment at all. And and if you're looking at whole life as an investment alternative, everybody likes to use buy term and invest a difference as, as the comparison. I'm like, no, that's not the same conversation. You should look at buy term and save the difference. And if you still think that makes sense, then good for you. Good luck. You know, right. but it won't. I mean, when you look at it through the lens of like, what do I need this money to do for me and what? problem is this pile of money solving for me it's not supposed to be your investment i always call it the basf of of the financial space if you remember back in the 90s and nfl days and nascar they'd always have a basf car Mm -hmm. basf would always say at basf you know we don't make your fishing line we make it stronger we don't make the paint you make we or you use we make it brighter and their whole tagline was at basf we don't make the products you buy we make the products you buy better and so whole life is not the investment you make, it just makes the investment you make better. Right. And so that's it, it's the BASF of the financial world. That's what whole life insurance is. And so when we, when we look at this and we go, all right, what, what do we need our money to do for us? And we, we start checking boxes of like, all right, I believe we need safe, liquid, guaranteed, accessible capital. And having access to that capital is going to help us be a better investor, right? Like to me, that's that's huge, right? And we're not going out and speculating and taking all this risk. If I'm going to keep my money safe, I want to keep it in a place where it's going to be with an institution that I know is going to be stable, right? right. One mutually held life insurance company has failed since 1840. 560 whatever banks have failed since 2008, right? <laughs> right. Okay, like so. I don't know. Like, but F- no, no people have. No one has problem with flowing their money to a bank. Right. Well, that's what we're talking about. Because yeah, I know. And so it's it's so it's all about flow. I think I think, you know, one of the one of the things um is is hard. I think a confused mind always says no. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think there are certain elements of talks around whole life insurance that are true at some point in time, but are positioned and marketed in a way that don't necessarily make sense to people. Um, and because it seems too good to be true and in a way it is too good to be true and eventually it can work, but it doesn't work right away. And I always kind of tell people you can't solve long-term problems with short-term thinking, right? Right. So we have to be thinking from a long-term perspective because if we're thinking short-term, well then guess what? Go put your money in a 5% high yield savings account right now. And that's going to get you, you could do infinite banking with a 5% high yield savings account in a way and do you know, do a collateralized loan and guarantee it with a savings account and all that stuff. But, you know, what happens when when the savings account rates go back down to tenth of a percent, half right. a percent, right. you know, something of that nature? It's it's all these people like to do that. You know, I did a video. It's funny. I did a video a year and a half, two years ago, and it was all about the fact that whole life is a better bond. It's a bond alternative, and it's going to give you uh, like bond-like long-term returns. You're going to have money market-like short-term liquidity, but you're going to get muni bond-like tax treatment. And it's going to be a better uh, overall result for you in life because that's what really matters. And now people are like watching that video. It's so funny. It's like my most watched video on YouTube right now. It's just short and it's uh, getting like 500 views a day. And everybody's ripping on me. Because they're like, oh, bonds are paying 6% now. How do you look? This video aged well and this and that. And I'm like... (laughs) What an ass hat! Like, you know, it, it just it, the whole world changes. You know, it's like you first of all get the context. Two years ago, that wasn't the environment. Right now, you have this little bubble of time where you're right. But I'm not doing this for this year. I'm doing this because I'm looking at beyond just getting the return this year. I'm looking at it as a full system to create wealth and backstop that wealth to provide multi-generational wealth. And I think the biggest confusion point that people have is that you do not get wealthy with a whole life policy. The whole whole life policy can self-complete and make your family wealthy if something tragic happens to you, right? Because if I'm saving money in a savings account, in a high yield savings account, and I die, whatever I got there goes to them and it's gonna be taxable. If I die when I save it in a whole life policy, it's called a self-completing plan. That's why I say a properly designed whole life insurance product is the only policy in the world 
that will make sure only financial product in the world that will make sure what you want to happen will happen when you want it to happen, whether you're here to see it or not. Right. It's because if you die, it self completes. It's 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 the idea of buy your net worth, build your cash flow. Right. Right. If you think about that. You and I, we have a, a, a future potential net worth that if we operate as diligent human beings, productive members of society, a life insurance company is going to look at us when we go to apply for insurance and they're going to say, hey, Devin, at some point in time, if you keep doing what you're doing right now, even assuming you don't increase your productive value, right? But in this moment of time, this is how much money we think you're going to be worth in the future if you just keep doing what you're doing, right? Right. And what they do is they, they call that your human life value. Right. And so then they say, hey, Devin, because of the fact that you are doing this and we think your potential future net worth is this, we're going to let you buy that amount of insurance right now. That's how they determine it. Yep. Right. So think about it this way. We're all working. And if you think beyond yourself and stop being narcissistic and think about your family, think about the next generations. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to everybody else. Like, you know, like then, then you, you have the ability to realize like, how powerful is it that I could put my money in a system that I can use it and leverage it to create, ultimately become who I need to be in this world and this life to create the life that I want for myself and my family and have a backstop on the backside of it that if anything happens to me, everything I feel like I'm put on this earth to do will be self-completed in an instant. I will say when something happens to you. Sure. Right? Because totally. it, it's inevitable you're right. going to pass away. Totally. And I always tell people to build wealth, you need to get rid of eroding factors, mm -hmm. things that erode your wealth. And what are those things? Taxes yep. and paying interest to other people, yeah. right? Yep. So if you start a whole life insurance policy with a mutually owned company that pays dividends, yep. it's very important, yeah. not an IUL, yeah. mutually owned company, whole life, you start that as early as possible in your life, totally. you're giving that money as long as possible to grow until mm -hmm. your inevitable death. Mm -hmm. When you pass away, it all grew tax-free. When you pass away, it's paid tax-free to your heirs. Yep. And if you teach them how to use them, they take that tax-free money and fund more mm -hmm. insurance policies on their life that grow tax-free. When their inevitable death happens, it's paid tax-free to their heirs, your grandkids. Totally. They should teach their kids, your grandkids, the same thing. So it perpetuates wealth. 100%. And you can... So that's getting rid of the tax part, mm -hmm. right? You can get rid of paying interest to other people, banks and such, by building this, um, this pile of money, this cash value, mm -hmm. to borrow from it mm -hmm. and pay yourself the interest you would have paid a bank. Yep. So now you're actually getting that interest, or you're keeping it, I should say. You're keeping it. Instead of giving it to someone else. Right. So I want to show you guys. I can't show you, I guess, because you yeah. can't see my screen. But sure. I just had uh, my second daughter. She was born on the second. Awesome. We've already got a life insurance policy starting on her. In the and works. I, again, guys. 14 days old, basically. Compound interest takes time. So the longer you give it, the bigger it gets. So if we look at this policy, I'm going to be putting in $10,000 a year mm -hmm. for the first 21 years of her life. Okay. Okay. After yep. that, it drops down to uh, it drops down to 6,000 bucks. Okay. I can pay 6,000 bucks on it until she's 95 years old. Cool. Okay. And Here's, you can hand this to her. That's the plan. Yep. So $10,000 a year goes in. When she's 21 years old, she has $280,000 in cash value. Amazing. So it's, it's made a little bit of money. Sure. But here's the thing. I have access to all that cash value in the meantime. Because so, you own it and control it. Right. So right. I can take the cash value and go make more mm -hmm. and start more policies for her. Sure. Here's the beautiful thing. And this is why you have to look long term. Mm -hmm. The first year I put in 10 grand, the cash value is 5,300. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would look at that and say, well, that's stupid. You just lost 4,700 bucks. Yeah. Why would you do that? Sure. I didn't lose 4,700 bucks. I got a death benefit. God forbid my daughter passes yep. away of $525,000. Right. So I'm protecting her life with that. Totally. Using the 5,356 bucks in cash value to go make more. Mm hmm but you have to look long term. So when she is, let's say, thirty, six thousand dollars in premium goes in, the cash value goes up by twenty seven thousand. 
Well, you know what's interesting about what you just said too? I mean, that's amazing. But I think it's funny that you say, oh, I put $10,000 in and people look at that and they go, oh, you only have 5,300, so you lost $4,700 of money. You didn't lose it. You right. just you just lost control of that money for a short period of time. Right. If you were to take that money and put it into a 529 savings account, you'd lose 100% control of it. Yep. Yet people would be applauding you yep. for planning for the future yep. into an asset that has all this risk and really isn't, it doesn't come with any of the benefits and ultimately is is not going to give you the flexibility for the future that you want. Right. Right. So it just goes to show how uneducated people are with money. And if people just focused on saying, hey, I'm going to get a policy on myself, I'm going to get a policy on my kids, and then when my grandkids are born, you could literally, in this lifetime, you could change the future for generations. And then you start building trust planning into there and all these different things. It That's when it's ninja moves. Yeah. I mean, now we're talking... You, you literally can set up like four, five, six generations out. And I don't care where you are right now. I grew up in a trailer park. You know, everybody has the ability to change the path and the direction of your family. Yep. You know, you know, I, I grew up in Vermont in a little trailer park with a hole in my bedroom floor when it was 20 below zero out. And I had to sleep with three blankets on. My parents full of love, amazing people. Uh, I wouldn't be the person I am without them. They know nothing about money. Right. You know what I mean? They know not, and which whatever, that's that's most of America. Same right. With my parents. Right. And so, you know, you look at kind of where we are now and and what we've built and like, you know, I've had a lot of support emotionally over the years, but not really financially, right? And now, you know, we've I've got Life 180. We've got all this stuff going on. We just launched a private equity fund. We're buying a hotel in the Dominican Republic. We're moving down to, you know, live on a Caribbean island in the beach, you know, like all these things. And it's it just goes to show. And and I know for generations, my my family is never going backwards. They're just going to get wealthier. Exactly. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. That's the crazy part. It exactly. is a guarantee. And I mean, how amazing is that? For, for in one generation, you go from trailer park to perpetual wealth perpetual wealth yeah because guys like, i'll touch on this uh illustration one more time because it speaks right to what you're saying yeah is my daughter brooklyn harper she will have let's say when she's 21 what was it uh just like under two hundred and eighty thousand dollars in yeah. cash value she'll never have to borrow from a bank like if she nope. wants to go to college yep she borrows from her policy. She pays yep. herself back mm -hmm. for that instead of paying on a student loan. Mm -hmm. She wants to buy a car. She uses her policy. Totally. I'm going to teach her how to use this, and then I can assign it to her as the owner. I love it. So now she funds it. She uses the money. Heck so let's yeah. let's look at when she is likely to die. Okay. The average life expectancy for women is right around 80. Okay. Right now. Sure. Who knows what it'll be when she's 80? Totally. It'll probably be 280. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Maybe. Who yeah. knows? But let's say 80 years old. Let's see. She will have cash value of $5.3 million. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's say she uses all that money to go make more. Mm -hmm. Okay. So she goes and buys an apartment building. She buys things that are cash flowing. Totally. And she passes away. Mm -hmm. She doesn't pay any of the cash value back. Her death benefit at that point, it started at $524,000. Yeah. It is $6,360,468. Her death benefit would pay off. All the loans she took, five point mm -hmm. three million. Mm -hmm. So her family, my grandkids, would get a million bucks tax free. Yep. They'd also get all the stuff she bought and all with the, the assets debt free. Right. So now they control all the assets 100%. she bought with no debt, and they take the million dollars that's tax free to buy more policies on themselves, so and that again the wealth just perpetuates. And if those assets are real estate, in today's tax code, it's a step up in cost basis. Yes. And so the tax advantage is huge. Yes. It's amazing. There, it is it is the best foundation. I can't speak today. <laughs> Foundational. Were you sucking on ice cubes before I got here? Like, what's going on? Is your mouth no? Down? No, I, I, had, I had surgery on my mouth. Oh. I got okay. a, a bone grafting. Mm. So, like, it just feels different in my yeah. mouth. So yeah. that's learning, probably what it is. Learning to talk again. It's okay. It's the best foundational asset you can have yeah. because literally all it does is it just makes all of your dollars more efficient. Yep, That's totally. It. But it takes time. It takes right? time. If you, so my question to anybody is, would you be willing to go through a seven-year capitalization phase where maybe it's a little less efficient from a bank if you knew for five generations? 
it would change everything for your family. Right. If the answer is no, go watch a different channel. Look yourself in the mirror and ask if you have a heart. Yeah, I mean, right? Totally. That's so, the way I look at it. It is. It's an incredible asset, and it is an asset. It actually is an asset. Totally. Of course. We, we had a property we just bought last year, um, Airbnb, mm-hmm. and they wanted to see um, six months of reserves. Okay. For the the payment. Yep. We don't keep a lot of money in the banks, mm-hmm. so we deploy the money, or it's in policies. Sure. Right. Mm-hmm. So in each bank account I have, I think I keep generally around five grand tops. Mm-hmm. Um, so we didn't have the six months of reserves in the bank account. We showed a cash value statement. It was good enough for them. Good enough for them. Mm-hmm. It is literally an asset that you can use to buy real estate. I mean, why wouldn't it be a good enough asset for the bank when twenty to twenty five percent of most banks' liquid capital reserves are sitting in whole life or you know properly valued life insurance? Ooh, let's right? talk about that. Yeah. So, I mean, how how much? I know the answer to this. A lot of people probably don't. Right. So banks own billions upon billions yep. upon billions of yep. dollars worth of whole life insurance. Yeah. How much do they own of IULs? So the answer. So okay. So this is hard. Um, the answer is nobody really knows. I'm going to say not much. Mm-hmm. Um, and and a lot of IUL agents right now are saying that banks own all this IUL. No, banks own cash value life insurance. That's the only thing. It doesn't go on the books as whole life insurance or IUL. It just goes on as cash value life insurance. But if you look at how Boley has been owned and how long it's been owned, and you look at the how, I, let's actually go there. Let's go, why do life insurance companies even use whole life insurance in the first place? This goes back to the beginning of our conversation about- Why do, why do banks use it? Yeah. 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 So this goes back to our conversation from the beginning, talking about the transition of the dollars, Mm -hmm. right? So if you go back to uh, the fact that we've had three different versions of the US dollar, we could actually probably say four if you account for going off the gold standard Mm -hmm. in 1971, but it's been technically the same banking system and and dollar still, right? With the Federal Reserve. So 1840, life insurance companies were launched. 1860, the Civil War happened. Uh, All the money printing and all the problems with Civil War uh, it was uh, we had a, a that currency died. Wasn't it the Confederate? Yeah, it was dollar? like it was. Yeah, I can't remember the names of it right now. But I, I've I've done a video on on this exact like going through step by step. But um, that currency died. 1870s uh, that currency that we had uh, that the currency that replaced the one that failed because of the Civil War uh, in the 18 late 1870s that one died. And then we had a different currency until uh, 1913. When everybody knows the Federal Reserve Act and the institution of the Federal Reserve, greatest theft of history of mankind. Good old tax code. Yep. And so that got launched, and we've been living in this dollar system ever since. You know, but that was seventy years that they had three different versions, and in the infancy of the life insurance space, right? And so, but think about why do banks utilize in our current banking system from 1913 to today? Why do banks use whole life insurance? Is because J.P. Morgan and all his banking cronies, if you ever wa- read the book Creatures from Jekyll Island. Such a good book. All of those people who you know, started this banking institution as a way to get Main Street America to put their money in there so they can leverage our money to create wealth for themselves. All of the banking people, where did they have their money before? Because the, the, they, the pitch for the Federal Reserve and the banking system was to create stability, mm-hmm. right? So they all knew it was a problem, and they didn't trust banks before. So where did they keep their money? They kept it with whole life insurance companies before 1913. Right. So they created (laughs) the Federal Reserve Act, and they created the banking institution system as we know it today. But when it started, they had all their money in whole life companies. So they said... So it just made sense to utilize whole life insurance as a tier one foundational asset, right? Because that's what they were already doing, right. and they knew that was going to create it was going to provide the stability, and so they 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 started utilizing it as a tier one asset, and they basically created this marketing scheme to get everybody to give our money to the bank, so they could then turn around and put it in real estate and whole life insurance. It's one of the reasons I love real estate and whole life insurance so much because that's what banks do. Yep, you know, and the most profitable business is banking. Banking. Totally. So why in the world would we be infinite bankers? Why would we do that? 
It doesn't make sense. Yeah, I know. It doesn't uh, make sense. Pe- people don't understand money. That's why I always tell people math and money are different. You yeah. Know? You know, uh, the, the money math is way different than math math, you know, and people just don't understand it because it's so outside of the way we're taught in school. So I'm thinking, uh, like, as you're saying that, I'm thinking, like, listeners and viewers are probably like, what? How in the world would a bank get a yeah. life insurance policy? Mm. It's very simple, guys. The bank can insure a key employee. Mm-hmm. So go to any bank and look around at how many vice presidents there are. Lot. Everybody's a vice president. A lot. So what happens when you become a vice president at a bank? The bank promotes you, gives you a little bump in your pay, and they say you're going to get a fully paid up life insurance policy. So they're, you don't have to pay a penny into it. It's fully paid up. Yep. When you pass away, if you're still working here, you'll get your family will get fifty thousand bucks, whatever the number is. Sure. How much is that policy actually for though? Million, two million, three million? Sure. So they'll give your family fifty, they'll get whatever else it is tax free. So they're insuring an employee. That's how they can actually get these policies. Right. They can't get it on the building. Right. It's on the employee. Totally. Right? Yeah. You have to insure somebody's life. Right. Yeah, I mean, and and then the the cash value in that asset is is an asset on the balance sheet of the bank, right? And and all you have to do. So it's interesting. Dave Ramsey launched a video uh, maybe two three months ago, and he was it was like heated debate with Infinite Banker, right? And first of all, it wasn't really an Infinite Banker. It was a guy who was thinking about getting Infinite Banking, and he didn't really understand it all. Oh. And 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 so Dave loves to do these videos where he like beats up on people that don't really understand what they're talking about, you know, and and so he looks really smart and then he makes his video public to the world and tries to back his point up. And so in the video, the guy, you know, Dave Ramsey's ridiculing him and the guy's like, well, you know, I, I why wouldn't I do this? This is what the banks are doing. Dave Ramsey literally goes, are you stupid? Banks aren't stupid enough to put their money into a, a, a horrible product like whole life insurance. That's what Dave Ramsey says. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, he's actually ignorant enough to make a statement? Is he, is he that arrogant? Is he that narcissistic? Is he that out of touch with the reality? Does he either not know or is he buying his own BS or like, what the deal? So I, I did a review on this and I went through and I said, all right, I'm going to go online. And there's a, a website. I can't remember the name of it. I got it bookmarked. But it lists out assets in life insurance by every bank in the country. There are 3,000 banks in this country with over $10 million of whole life insurance or life in, cash value life insurance assets. We don't know, going back to before, if it's whole life or IUL. I'll, I'll fully uh, openly acknowledge that. What I can tell you is that IUL didn't even exist until 1997, and that life insurance or banks have been doing this since 1913. Right. So, um, and here's what I, what I say when people go, well, why wouldn't they switch? Why wouldn't they switch? I'm going to go to the uh, the insurance back line of credit or the cash value line of credit. You can go to a bank and ask for a line of credit, leveraging and collateralizing the cash value in your whole life policy, and they'll give you 95 to 100 percent value of the cash value and a line of credit on it. If you bring an IUL to the table, they're not going to give you a loan. There are two companies that I've found that will give you a loan, and they give you a 50 percent or 70 percent loan to value. So if an ins- if a bank is smart enough to know that your IUL is way more risky and, and they won't even give you a loan against it the right. same way, do you think they're buying IUL for themselves? <laughs> I promise you they're buying whole life, not IUL. Just 100%. look at the way they treat IUL and look at the way history has played out. Just and logically. It, 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 listen, I get I live and breathe this stuff, and so do you, and people watching probably don't, but like when you really understand what to look for, you, the the facts aren't there. I mean, they're not. Like, right. there's no there's no bank that says this is our whole life insurance assets. They say here are our cash value assets of life insurance, and it does. And so that allows these snaky IUL agents to slip in and be like, IUL is a cash value. Look what they're doing, right? Mm. But if you really break down and you understand what to look for and the critical questions to ask, it's easy to use a little like fourth grade deductive reasoning and come to the conclusion that they definitely are not doing IUL. One big thing is that it came around in 1997. Yeah. Whole life. The first life insurance policies, they were term, I believe, in like the 1700s. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's all sorts of different insurance companies. History of insurance goes all the way back to England and like there's. 
right. all sorts of stuff. Yeah. But if you look at 1997 is when IE Wells came out, and when the banking system came about, which was with the tax code, was 1913, right? Yep. And you touched on it. Why would all these super wealthy people put their money into life insurance? With the, why would the banks do it? Because all the wealthy people were doing it before. Sure. Who started the the modern system? The Rockefellers, mm-hmm. J.P. Morgan Chase, mm-hmm. and uh, the president at the time. Um, Carnegie was, or it was um, Lendell. Yeah, I can't. He was a. I forget who the president was, but mm-hmm. they basically all came together, mm-hmm. and there was a problem in America. America was. A, a place where you had entrepreneurs. They mm-hmm. came here to be business owners. Mm-hmm. Those people, mainly Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, mm-hmm. and J.P. Morgan Chase, they said, you know what? We need more employees. Mm-hmm. We need more people to be employees to build our, uh, our, yeah, our system. Yeah. we Our empires. Yeah. Everyone can't just be their own business owners. Right. So what do they do? They create the schooling system where you indoctrinate people into being employees and pump out more employees so they can... Totally. Again, that's the system. So then what did they do? J.P. Morgan Chase, Mm -hmm. banking. Money goes into policies from the banking system. Totally. It's all perpetuated, and that's how it is formed. And people are so blind to the actual... What's actually happening. So true. There's a quote that says... uh, the biggest problem in America is not what people don't know. It's what they think they know that just ain't so. Yep. Yep. It's it's so true. Uh, it, it, the problem is people think they know something, and uh, it's just not the case. Like So, for instance, if you were to ask anybody, what's the average rate of return I should expect in my investments in the S&P 500? What do you think they'd say? Uh, like an average American. 8 to 10%. 8 to 10%. Okay. My question to you is why? Because that's what I've been told. Okay. And so I literally just did this video because I, I, a couple days ago, um, because I just, I realized like, I'm, I'm a, I'm a critical thinker. And the first thing I always ask is why, right? Mm-hmm. And it's just, I, I think it's, we need to start asking why more often. And so I, I, and, and I went down this path being like, all right, why do people believe that? Well, we go back in history. I was born in 1980. When were you born? 85. 85. So I was born in 1980. So it lines up perfectly with these stats. So in 1980, what was happening? Interest rates were uh, at all-time highs. Inflation was at 13.5%. Um, interest rates were over 19%. Um, mortgage rates were over 20%. We look at uh, everything that was going on. So rates were at an all-time high, which mean means that was sucking money out of the economy. Things were tough. And then it was also the creation of the 401k. 1981, Mm. the 401k became popularized. And it became uh, where the government passed a law, because actually 401ks were created in 1978, but 1981, a law got passed where people could do tax-deductible contributions to their 401k in 1981, okay? And so now what we have is high interest rates that were going to be plummeting for the next two decades, right? And we had all of a sudden every person on Main Street that had never thought about investing in mutual funds or the stock market became an investor. And so if you don't know anything about supply and demand, you now have millions of people that are flooding money into a low supply environment. That's what created the booming 80s, is reducing interest rates and this and this massive influx of new investment capital. Right. That's it. It's not more complicated than that, right? And so from 1980 to 1999. Do you know what the average return like of the of the S, of the S&P and the Dow and like all the indexes the were? The average or the actual? The actual. Actual. Actual let's return. Talk, let's talk actual. I would say 4. The actual was 15.4. Really? From 1980 to 1999. Wait, okay, I'm Fif- thinking of the last 20 years. I apologize. No, no, no. So I'm saying 1980 to 1999. Got it. Okay. Actual return was 15. 15.4. Wow. So, but the world we live in today. Wish I could have invested as a little toddler. Right? So think about this. Think about this, though. Why do people believe that go to school, get a job, invest in your 401k, all that stuff is the way to do things? Because that's what worked for 20 years when it first was created. But here's the crazy part. This is the crazy part. Look from 1929 to 1979, a 50-year window preceding that 20-year period. Mm-hmm. Do you know what the actual return was? 
Negative? It was 3.4%. Okay. Okay. So, from, and, and so that's 1929 to 1979. That's 50 years. From 2001, or 2000, I mean, to today, do you know what it is? I think it's about four. It's about, it's about 4.8. Right. Okay. And that's just because it's going better this year, right? And so uh, when you look at, we had about 4% before 1980 and about 4 plus percent after 1999, we had that 20 year window where it was 15% and everybody's saying you should expect eight to 10% because that was the time when all of the marketing around all these retirement plans came out and the whole world around us was never this, the way, you know, that's not how it was before. And it's not been the way it stayed, but nobody has taken a pause, hit the pause button to say, what's going on here? Wait, so let's, let's, let's think about this. So 1980 is when the 401k started. Yep. Right. Yep. So you're how old? 43? I'm 43. Okay. So you're 43 years old. Let's say 1980, yep. you're 18 years old. You're entering the workforce. Oh, it's huge. So you're like, oh, I should get a 401k. So if that's the case, people are just now seeing what a 401k does throughout, you know, a lifetime of paying into it, right? Sure. So there's no real proof that a 401k works. Actually, it's a failing financial experiment. It's it's proof that it doesn't work. Yeah. Like my dad had a 401k sure. and he is so terrified mm -hmm. to retire because mm -hmm. he's lost so much money in it. And again, if you lose 50%, you have to earn 100% just to get back to square one. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. So he's got, I think, like $230,000 mm -hmm. life savings. He's 67 years old. He can't go spend another 20, 30 years building it back up. It's a good thing he's got you. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I started a policy on him. And totally. I'm, I'm giving him the cash value. Sure. So it's like his retirement. Yeah. Um, but think about that, guys. A 401k started in 1980. If you were 18 years old when that started, 43 years later, you're how old? Uh, 61. Like, you're, That's retirement, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 59 and a half is yeah, when yeah. you can do it yeah, with no... So, sure. So, and right now, 401ks are down a lot. Down. However, whole life insurance has stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. It's been around since the 1800s. It only goes up. So, right. I... I Touched on those numbers with my daughter's policy. Yeah. When she's like 60, 70 years old, puts in six grand, it grows by like 90. Totally. So think about that. She puts in six. Let's say it grows by 90. She can take 90 as a policy loan. There's no taxes on loans. Yep. Take six of it, pay the next year's premium. She keeps $84,000 of tax-free income. It's amazing. It's, like it has stood the test of time. And it's predictable, right? Yes. Like, and that's the key. And so, so I just encourage everybody to think about like, and, and really ask why don't just look at numbers. Don't just listen to people, you know, give their opinions, including me, including Devin, right. go do your own research, right. you know, um, really break down the actual returns of the markets, really look at different time frames because, and, and you have to do research, like, because it's easy to look at those you know, if you look at the history of performance of the markets and then you see this one 20 year bubble bubble, and that's what it is. It was a bubble created by 1980 high interest rates, people flooding to the market. And the reason, by the way, that they were flooding into the market because the top marginal tax rate in 1980 was 70%, mm -hmm. right? So if you had the ability to defer taxes in 1980 at 70% and pay when it's 35 or 40%, you're smart, winning, smart you're move. winning. But I don't know about you. I, I I try to tell people like I don't think there's any good or bad investment. Is it good or bad or for, for you? Mm -hmm. And is it in alignment with your values and your beliefs? And the problem that we have with most people in America is that their money is not in alignment with what they truly value and what they truly believe. And that for me is what my passion point is for helping people is to help people align their money with their values and beliefs. And if I were to ask most people, you do this, I do this all the time, and say, what do you believe about? politics? What do you believe about the economy? What do you, you believe about inflation and the national debt and unfunded liabilities and all the direction things are going? People are freaking the hell out because right. they have no faith in it. But if you talk to most people and you say, all right, 
you have no faith in the government. You have no faith in the future. You don't think national debt is going to go down. You're worried about taxes going up, right? All these things. Where's all your money saved for retirement? Qualified account, IRA, 401k, something of that nature. Right. And it's no wonder you're failing with your money because you don't even know what to do with your money to align it with your values and beliefs. And I'm not being critical to the people doing that because it's just the, the system is 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 goading you into doing something to keep you plugged in and a slave to the system. Right. That's the reality. Right. But if you want a different result, you have to be willing to do things differently and you have to be willing to become somebody who's worthy, you know, this of 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 living the life that you want to live. That's I, I always tell like my favorite thing about what we do is is coaching people through a process of being like you are where you are in life because of who you are in life. And what I love about utilizing whole life insurance as a foundational asset is it's going to force you to become somebody different so you can actually create the life that you want to live. Yes. We uh, we had a podcast two days ago with Dan Clark. Do you know cool. Dan? No. Um, awesome dude. He's such a good dude. Um, he's like an international speaker. He's professional speaker, Hall of Fame. So oh, like, cool. Dude so is just a legit stud at speaking on stage. Love it. And um, we talked about the fact that Everyone has the ability to become more valuable. Most people just don't do it. Like, where do you spend your time? That's the main thing. Amazon Prime and Netflix, baby. Think about that. That's what most <laughs> people do. Or, or video games, sure, right? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. You can spend your time doing one of two things. Mm -hmm. Entertaining yourself. That's one thing you can do. So that would be Netflix and chill. That would be your video games. That would be anything to entertain yourself to pass the time. Sure. Or educate yourself. Yep. And most people choose the first option. They want to entertain themselves. They don't want to educate themselves. But if they educate themselves, they become more valuable and they become more worthy and deserve a better life. Right? Yep. That's what we talked about. It was two days ago. Gosh. I'm That's like awesome. losing track of you, days because of the baby. I, I, <laughs> bro, get used to it. You, I mean, you've been there, done that. It's another six months of that for, yeah, in, from my experience. Here, here's so I, I read this statistic the other day. You know the average Netflix subscriber, how many hours a week the average Netflix subscriber spends on platform watching per week? Per week. Oh, let me get ready for this. Here. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say at least six hours a day, seven days a week, so 42 hours. That's high. So that that's high. But like there, I'm sure there are plenty of people doing that. This is, by the way, this is average. Okay. So including all the people. Like me that subscribe that maybe watch an hour a week, right? So average 18 hours a week, Jesus. including the millions of people that probably subscribe and don't Jesus. watch that much, 18 hours a week for average. So let's just assume that's 18 hours a week. What would your life look like? What would everybody's life look like if they were to take half of that time? Nine hours a week. Nine hours a week and commit to learning something. Commit to developing themselves. Commit to growing as a human being. Commit to figuring out, all right, what, what are my unique passions, my unique abilities, my unique interests, and how could I evolve and grow and expand and figure out a way to add value and contribute to the world in a better way and, and actually create myself as an asset, you know? Um, it's, it's just one of those things where if everybody did that, it, well, I'll say it this way. Everybody has the ability to do that. So when yes. when people, and I get pretty opinionated and I can get kind of abrasive to people in comments and whatever, because it really drives me crazy when people are like, oh, you just don't get it. You've already got it figured out, you know, this and that. It's like, I, there's no excuse. I don't care how much money you're making or not making. I don't care. I, it, it, to me, everybody has the ability to create the life that you want to live. And if you don't have what you want, it's your own fault. Right. It's your own fault. You have the ability to be more intentional about how you're living your life. That's my company, Life 180, is an acronym, Living Intentionally for Excellence. That's what the life is. It's an acronym. That's why I always capitalize it. it drives me nuts when people write it lowercase. Like, no, you know, no. This is what it, <laughs> ah. But, you know, and so, like, but we have to be more intentional with how we spend our time. There, You and me have the same amount of time in the day that Elon Musk has. Right. We are losers compared to that guy. Yeah, because he's know? he's more efficient with his time. He's a monster, right? Like, and and granted, I wouldn't want to live his life, right? You know, I wouldn't want like I value my family and time, and you know, there's all sorts of stuff out there. 
I want the freedom. He's an alien, though. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so, you know, but you and I, like, so for me, all, all this stuff that we're doing, my wife and I are moving to the Dominican Republic. You know, we're going to be spending a lot of our time down there. I'll be traveling back and forth. We'll be traveling back and forth. But that's going to be kind of home base. You know, we're not selling our home here in Arizona. Um, but we are going to be spending a, a bulk of our time down there. We're running a, a hotel and we're doing all this stuff. But Are you and, selling the Jeep? And that's great. I am. I can't believe that. Bro. This guy is the biggest Jeep fan of all time. You're it's, selling the Jeep? Yeah, I just listed it yesterday. Oh wow! It was. It, I had a ceremony. It was. A sad, <laughs> it was a sad day. It was a sad day. Um, I listed it. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm. I'm bringing it in tomorrow, getting it fixed up, and it sucks. I'm like replacing all these things that I, you know, I've beat up on the trail and getting it fixed up. And it's going to be anybody in the Jeep market if it's still available. It probably won't be available by the time this comes out. But yeah, it's. Uh, it, it, it's a sad day, but you know, what I did was on uh, the day before I went to list it, I went and I test drove. Well, I'll tell you why. So I was going to try to import my Jeep to the Dominican Republic. That's what I would have thought you would have They done. won't let me because it's one year too old. <clears throat> really? Yeah, they'll only let me import a vehicle as old as 2018. I swore to my, I swore to myself, I'd never sell my Jeep, um, but I'm not going to let it sit you know, yeah. for a year, not getting driven at all and all I, these I things. I can drive it for you. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll, I'll get some use out of it. So we're, we're gonna, we're gonna just sell it. And I, the day before, just to make myself feel better, I went and test drove Jeeps all day long. Like we just <laughs> test drove like 12 Jeeps. It was crazy. Just, just so I was like, all right, I'm going to figure out and then I'm going to buy a new one. And in like six months, I'm going to import it and we'll, we'll get it down to the DR. That's good. My, go my there. daughter was looking at Jeeps. She's yeah. 16. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we took her to look at new cars, mm. and she's buying a car from her policy. She has three policies. Yep. So she's going to have a job. Mm -hmm. She's going to make the payment on the car note to back policy. to her policy. Yeah. So she gets all the That's money amazing. back for the car. Mm -hmm. She sees how the banking system works. Yeah. Um, eventually, I'll assign those policies to her. Sure. Setting her up for huge success in life. It's amazing. But she was looking at Jeeps, and I'm like, all right, <laughs> so here's what you got to think about, baby. Not great on gas, right? Not but great. they hold their value. They hold their value, but not great on gas. Mm -hmm. um, Especially they, when you put 35-inch wheels on them or tires. And, and you, you have know, to because that's, when they, that's, when, they look, that's when they look dope. All that stuff. So yeah. not great on gas. I get 10 and a half miles a gallon on my Jeep, by the way. It's horrible. It's it's really not good. For a kid that's going to be it working part-time. It costs me part -time, $30 to drive here from my house. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I'm just fine. <laughs> but like, think about this. Her first car, she's going to have a job part-time. Let's say yeah. her payment, yeah. it, it would have been like a thirty-five, forty thousand dollar first car. Yeah. So her payment back to herself is probably gonna be like five hundred bucks a month. That's a big That's payment. A, if you're working part time and making let's say nine hundred to a thousand. Half your income. Then you've got a lot of gas. You've got insurance. You've mm -hmm. got you want to get your nails done. You want to get your hair did, right? All these things. I had to like talk her out of it. I'm mm -hmm. like, no, baby, you need to like be smarter with your money. It is your money. You're yeah. paying the payment. You do your thing. Yeah. You're getting the money back. But if you have like a three hundred dollar payment. Yeah. With a car that gets way better gas mileage, so your yep. gas bill is a lot less. Like I've been trying to instill in her all the things that weren't instilled in me growing up. And I made so many mistakes with money because sure. my parents knew nothing about totally. it. Totally. Absolutely. So this little girl is gonna be dangerous, I'm telling you. By the time she's like thirty years old, she might be running the world. Hey, that's what we Who need. Who knows? That's what we need though. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean it's it, it like all that stuff. I mean, at, at the end of the day, though, whether she got the Jeep or went a cheaper route or whatever, at least she's doing it through her policy. Yeah. Um, it's going to reduce her cost of money on that. It's going to she's going to recapitalize her system. She's going to keep that money in her own financial ecosystem. Um, you know, from a cash flow perspective, if she does make a mistake and take on the too big of a payment, she's going to have a little more flexibility. It's not going to bang up her credit. It's not going right. to like all these things. Now you do want to handle the loan and manage it. Like, and I mean, I'm sure, you know, oh, I'm making her, you sign. know what? Dad's going to bail her out a couple of times. That's what's going to happen. I'm making her sign a contract. Yeah. So she misses a payment. I uh -huh. take the car. Uh huh. Right. Sure. But why would you miss a payment on something that's going back to an account that you have access to right. again? Right. Yeah. I mean, it makes no sense not to Right. make the it's payment. Just, Cause yeah. if, if it's a $500 payment, you make that payment, it goes into her policy. She didn't lose control of that 500. It's right. just in her policy now. Sure. It's not saying yeah, you're recapitalizing account. your own account. Yeah. Totally. So I don't know, man. It's it's crazy to think I have a 16 year old. Mm -hmm. I like, have a 12 year old now. Dude, just four years from now. I it, know. It's I, crazy because it goes when she was 12, she was like this little daddy's girl, like mm -hmm. so innocent, like hanging onto my hip, like everywhere I went. She's 16 now. She's like, wants nothing to do with dad. Be gone, dad. She's like, 
talking to boys now. She's got this little boyfriend. Oh God. Named Sammy. Oh God. And no. No, don't talk like that. Dude, I try to like no, him, stop. I try to instill I don't fear hear into him. I don't want to hear it. Every time I, I see him, I like it. shake his hand and almost try to break it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just look through his soul. But he's like six five, two twenty. No. He's actually like six one. Uh, I'm five seven. Yeah. But okay. she says that all of her like friends that are guys are scared of me. Mm-hmm. Cause I'm I'm like shorter, but I'm built. Yeah, yeah. So and I don't you know, know people. And I have a gun tucked every time. <laughs> I have yeah, a gun exactly. tucked every time I meet him. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, well, You're dude, like, you got pecs, I got techs. Dude, we could go for we could go for hours. We could. We've already been going for like an hour and a half. All right. So That's awesome. How can people follow you? Uh, you know, YouTube at Life One Eighty. <clears throat> um, on Instagram and TikTok, it's at Real Chris Kirkpatrick. Uh, anybody that wants to reach out for anything. the real Chris, the Kirkpatrick. real Chris Kirkpatrick, not, not this, the NSYNC, one. not this NSYNC phony guy. Yeah. Um, no, you know, what's really funny about that though. My wife was Mrs. American in 2021, the married version of like, you know, the pageant beauty queen thing. Did and you tell her to quit playing games with your heart? Yeah. Ex- oh, that's, that's <laughs> low. That's low, bro. That's low. So, oh, wow. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's got jokes. Did you tell her there was no strings oh, attached? Come on, man. So, so listen to this though. She goes up. She goes up. Not even kidding you. She went up to Vegas for this charity event, right? And she sends me, and I had to stay home with the kids. And I'm usually like, we have this history. I was a pro poker player, so I would always go to Vegas to play poker tournaments, and she'd stay home with the kids. <clears throat> and so she went up to Vegas for this charity event as Mrs. American, and I stayed home with the kids. She sends me a selfie with her and Chris Kirkpatrick. Oh, did you tell her bye bye and, bye? And and she <laughs> and she <laughs> and she she you're horrible, bro. The um so she literally oh, sends God. me a text message with the picture with the caption, oh. I'm and I'm with the real Chris Kirkpatrick today. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I'm like, babe, that just cuts way too low. <laughs> so so yeah, deep. Cuts, yeah, so. cuts deep. So yeah, but that's where you find me on social media. Um, is is there? And um, yeah, I mean, most of my stuff is on YouTube. I I, I enjoy the long form content yeah. because I like to focus on the meat and the education of it all. <clears throat> I'm a bit more of a nerd about this stuff than most people. Um, I'm not nearly as suave in a, in a good way. And yeah, I'm not the suave, you know, full of swag guy that Devin is here. You know, he's way cooler than I am. Um, so I think. You are. I mean, there's no <laughs> doubt about it. I have. I, you have a way higher cool factor than I have. Um, but don't, don't but it's knock awesome. your, don't knock yourself down a notch. But it's cool. awesome. Hey, man, I get to move to an island and mm. nobody else does. This so, is true. I'm, know, I'm actually jealous. You get to come with me. I, we'll, our I next will be visiting. We'll be doing down there in in my new studio. Yeah, you guys got to stay tuned for that because it's going to be in a studio. The backdrop is like the it's jungle, like the jungle and the ocean. And the ocean it's and amazing. He's going to be having like ayahuasca retreats. Yep. It's going to be amazing. We're going to be doing healing, breath workshops, yoga mm-hmm. retreats, ayahuasca retreats, uh, other traditional plant medicine retreats, uh, doing all sorts of things down there. Uh, so stay tuned. It's going to be amazing. Let's. We've got a couple minutes. Let's get into that a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I, ayahuasca. So this is the encore. Yes. This is the encore. It's like the concert. We get called back out on stage. So all right, here let's we go. talk about ayahuasca because that's I hear yeah. it so mm-hmm. often. I've never done it. Yep. I hear so much about it. Yeah. What's your take? Um, how much time do we have? Uh, so the, uh, you know, my take on ayahuasca is that it's, uh, A, I'm shocked how many people don't even know what it is. Um, and um, my, t- my, my opinion on, I guess let me say it this way. My, my history, I've never done a drug. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never smoked marijuana. No I've, sticky icky? Nothing. Nothing, bro. Wow. I never did. Dude, I was any- Snoop Dogg in high school. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I've never, I've literally never touched a joint or a pipe or anything to my lips. Never took, taken a drag off a cigarette. Um, I'll have a margarita every now and then. That's like my vice, mm-hmm. right? Um, I, I was a, a really high level athlete growing up, you know, and so to me, like all that was just going to destroy my life, you know, and, and it was just, it wasn't <laughs> worth it. And so um, my whole opinion on psychedelics, I, I, my opinion was like LSD and mushrooms. And it was like, who does that? And I knew some people that did it, but they did it very recreationally. And they did it, they were kind of idiots, you know? Yeah. And so my, my perspective, like I had no respect for any of that. And then, um, you know, we hit some personal 
stuff uh, in, in life, and it happened. And, you know, I went through some coaching, and um, the, the idea of ayahuasca was brought up to me. And my initial... When was gut, this? Uh, this was <laughs> 12 months ago. Not even. So recent, okay. Yeah, maybe 10 months ago. And it was brought to my attention. Um, and, of course, I've been watching Joe Rogan, and I've been watching... You know Aubrey Marcus, and I've been seeing these other people that are talking about ayahuasca, and you know Ron White. I don't know if you know Ron White, the comedian, the guy who says you can't fix stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that like the blue collar comedy guy. guy. Right? Older guy's yeah, yeah. always got a, a drink and a bourbon in his hand and a cigar in his in his hand. Yeah. You know he's he's like a raging alcoholic, and he'd been battling alcoholism. I watched his interview um, where he's like for years, decades, he's been trying to get sober. He could never break through. With counseling, inpatient rehab, he'd always get out and he'd get back on the on the sauce, you know? And um, he did this one interview uh, about how he went and did a week of ayahuasca and he's been sober ever since. Really? Yep. Hmm. And I was like, wow, that's intense, you know? And so what would it look like in my life? And um, I don't care who you are. Everybody's got traumas. Every Everybody's got... Um, self-limiting beliefs. Everybody's got our deep down in our subconscious the things that hold us back from becoming who we want to be. Right. And, um, you know, I just realized I was in a spot where uh, I love my life. And from the outside looking in, uh, I think most people would, you know, kind of look at it as almost perfect. Um, but it was not perfect. And I had an opportunity to go down and uh, my wife and I went to Colombia, and we did a week-long ayahuasca retreat, and it was world-changing. Um, it allowed me to break through the the walls that I had in my subconscious, where I remember getting there, and I'd never remember I'd never done any kind of mind-altering substance in my life, and. So was there a lot of anxiety behind that, like right before? No, because like I just I I just felt called to it. You know, Got it. and I wasn't doing it recreationally. I was doing it. I went to a place in the Amazon. We had a a Taita who's literally like fourth generation shaman, basically. So they're kind of you coaching know. you through the experience. You, there was twenty people there. We did an integration mm -hmm. circle ahead of time. Uh, everybody talked about it and and um, talked about what we were doing there, what what we we're there for. And my mindset was like, I didn't even know what I was there for. I just felt called to it. And my intention was just like, I just want to open up, like mm -hmm. help me reach places of myself that I've never been, yeah. that I've never seen, you know, that I've never been w able to open up and get to the depths of, of what's holding me back. Mm -hmm. You know, why, you know, why am I where I am and why am I not where I want to be yet? You know, that kind of deal. And it opened up things that I didn't want to see. It opened up things that were hard emotionally to battle with. Um, and I would say that my first three journeys on ayahuasca were the hardest three days of my life. Uh, I, it was to the point where it was almost hard to go back for a fourth day. Um, but through coaching and ceremony and integration work and all the things that we got to go through, I went back in and thank God I did because it was then two of the most amazing days back to back. Um, and, you know, it was almost like I had to be broken down to be built up. Mm -hmm. And um, so we did that. My wife did it. She had her own experience uh, that I won't get into. That was it was awesome. Um, and we we came home and five weeks later, we were like, man, we don't feel finished with the medicine yet. And so we went back and um, it was it was just phenomenal. And um, and it's just given me so much more clarity about who I want to be, how I show up in the world, about how I view other people's opinions and perspectives of me and what I'm doing and, you know, all that stuff. And just, I'm, a, I'm, I've never been more clear about what my purpose is on this earth. Uh, and it's all because of ayahuasca. It's all because of my time and ceremony and the work. I would say that it's not a magic pill. It doesn't just fix you, but it helps you see things in a way where you almost get to live it and experience it. Mm. Like I'll say this, I died. I got to experience dying. Was that that was the first couple of days where it was like a rough second day? I got, got to literally experience dying. Imagine yourself on your, you know how in, on the in the life insurance business <clears throat> we always tell people, imagine yourself on your deathbed. You got all your family and friends around you, and like, how are you going to feel? What are you going to think? Imagine actually living it. I lived it. Crazy. I felt myself die, and I felt myself fight 
death and experience all the emotions of all the unfinished business that I have in my life right now for my kids, for my wife, for my business partners, for the investment fund that we're building, for all the things that I want to accomplish over the next 30 years that left unfinished, I literally got to feel what was it, what would it be like if I died right now and I went through that whole experience in conversations with my kids and my partners and my wife and fighting, not being willing to die. And then the more you fight it, the more pain mm. comes in. Crazy. And and then I you get it gets so painful that you finally just have to give up and, and succumb. And you you allow yourself to die on the medicine. And I remember when I first got there, the guy who was the lead facilitator, his name is Jared, and he goes, guys, <clears throat> and there was only one person out of the 20 that had ever done ayahuasca before. And Jared said, guys, you are 100% safe. Nobody's ever died on ayahuasca. It's going to take you places, but it's to the point where even if you feel like you're going to die, let yourself die. You can't die. The only way out is through. And I remember listening to him being like, this guy's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> this guy's got to be, he's nuts. There's no way. There's no way that's going to happen to me. Day two, I remember being there. And you're in and out of kind of that conscious where I'm like, okay, I this is it. Like, I'm on the medicine and whatever. And, and like, allow yourself to die. And then you start being like, all right, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, I'm going to succumb to it. I'm going to do it. And then you start doing it, and then you're like, wait a minute, what if what if this is real? What if I'm actually because dying? Because it feels so real. Yeah. Right? What if I'm actually dying? This is it. I don't want to die. I'm not ready for this. Right. You know? And so you fight it and you battle and you have these conversations, and they're real mm -hmm. as real gets. And uh, and you finally do it and you finally give up. And as soon as I, I I died, I literally felt myself melt under the floor. It was create like disintegrate into dust. And I woke up immediately and I was completely lucid immediately. Like Back, I mean, still a little on it, but like mentally fully aware. It was the most powerful experience of my life. And and that was one out of 10 journeys I've done this year. Just Dude, to give you an idea. Geez, like now I like feel like I need to do it because <laughs> yeah, man, the insane. power of the mind is absolutely insane. Most people can't fathom how powerful this thing is. Totally. Because we can't, what's the whole um, stat? We only tap into like 10% of our brain. Sure. So these substances, these things, ayahuasca, shrooms, whatever, it helps mm -hmm. you tap into different parts of your brain. Yeah. Like, what's possible? Yeah. Like, what is really possible? And I always talk about, I talked about this with Dan a couple of days ago. My biggest motivating factor, the person that motivates me the most, yeah. is me. Yeah. 40, 50 years from now. Yeah. Like, when I pass away, whenever that is, meeting that man, did mm -hmm. I live up to who I could have been? Totally. Or did I fall short? Yeah. So... If I could have that experience of like dying today and knowing I am nowhere near that man, oh, dude, yet, it's insane. That would make me, as soon as I'm lucid, be like, okay, Whoa. I gotta, I gotta, I got some work I gotta do. Well, I'll tell you this people, people that know me really well, like Caleb Williams, you know, I, I, he's like a brother, right? And, you know, I've talked to him pretty intimately about this, uh, you know, off the record and stuff, you know, and, um, you know, he comes to me, he's like, dude, you're like a different person now. Like, in, and he's like, I could see it in your eyes. Like you have this conviction, you know, and you, you, uh, and I do, I have more clarity now. I've never been more certain of everything we're doing, of the business and the agency we're building, of the investment fund and the assets that we're building and the cash flow creation and the freedom creation and, you know, the value that I'm trying to add to the world. And like, and, and it's so different than what most people do, but it's so clear to me. And I have like, Everything is is very orderly, and um, it before it was scared scary to me, and now it's just like another this, step this in the process. This is what I do. It's just another step in the process. Guys, listening to this, please don't just go do, no. do a bunch of drugs. Yes, <laughs> please. That is, and I'll say this: I still don't look at it as if I've done a drug, right? To Dead me, experience. it was a medicine. Got it. Done in a ceremony, controlled environment. Not just a controlled environment, a ceremony with a professional Taita shaman who is designed with a professional Taita, not one of these dumb neo shamans that, you know, like would be like me going down, you know, for 10 days and being like, oh, I love ayahuasca. I'm going to get certified <clears throat> to be a shaman. Like, don't do that crap, right? Go work with somebody who's like heritage. This, the shaman that I worked with grew up in the jungle. 
Like, share, share the information with me, and yeah. I'll put it in the okay. description cool. if anyone wants to do it. Because, guys, I've been considering it for a while yeah. just because I've heard stories like this, but in no way, shape, or form am I saying, or is he saying, just go start doing a oh, bunch of please drugs. please don't. Right? Because I've seen drugs really take a hold of uh, my family. My brother totally. got hooked on meth. Oh, gosh. Bad when I was a kid. I got hooked on cocaine. Nobody's ever going to get hooked on ayahuasca. I promise you that. Like, that I can guarantee. There's like, Love but it. but here's here's the deal. I'm I'm gonna also throw another disclaimer out there. Don't do ayahuasca unless you're really hundred percent committed to dealing with your stuff because you're gonna see things that you didn't even know existed. You're gonna have to deal with problems that you didn't even know existed. Um, and and so be ready <clears throat> to do the work because otherwise it's like, you know, it's that four levels of of, of consciousness is consciously in, uh, unconsciously incompetent, consciously incompetent, and then consciously competent and then unconsciously competent and and it's like everybody right now is unconsciously incompetent you know, for the most part right you don't know the problems you don't realize all the things going on inside in your subconscious as soon as you go here and you do this you're gonna you're gonna have things that are churned up that you don't even know exist right now so if you're not willing and able and have the capacity in life to deal with it don't do it yet love it because it's gonna come hard and there's no stopping it. Love it. Well, guys, we'll, in the description, we'll have um, where you can get a hold of whoever he got a hold of for yeah. the whole experience. Um, so I will put that in here. Make sure to follow Chris on Life 180. It's his YouTube channel. You can learn so much from his videos. I learned a ton when I started learning about infinite banking. So check that out. And if you guys want to see him back on so we can talk more about Let's the ayahuasca it. stuff and all that. <laughs> Drop in the comments that you want to see him back on. We'll get him back on the show. Until then, guys, I love you.